I think it started recording. Yeah. Okay, let me introduce you then, if you're ready to go. Yes, I am. So, with great pre pleasure, let me introduce Alvaro Lozano Robledo, who come from Yukon, who will talk on toward the classification of Adelic dial representations attached to elliptic curves over Q. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always uh, a pleasure to be back uh, to uh, at BU, even if it's uh, virtually so. Um, today is actually a special date. I, I defended my thesis at BU on April 5th, uh, 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, yeah, it was exactly April 5th. So, uh, but in any case, so I, I would like to talk about some work that um, my collaborators and I have been doing uh, towards a classification of a delegate representations. I, I should say that the, the title is meant to be catchy, to catch your attention. We're really far, I think, from a classification of a delegate representations. But I would, uh, what I would like to do is that I don't think it's um, way too far in the distance. It's starting to be something that uh, we might see in the in the next uh, couple of decades or something, um, and um, I, I just want to explain sort of like what are uh, the the roadblocks to a classification of adelic Galois representations and uh, the kind of things that we do know how to do now, which is uh, a lot more than we knew just even ten years ago or so. And so let me let me begin. Um, so what we're going to do is attach to uh, to elliptic curves. Uh, we are going to attach what we call the adelic Galois representation. I'll, I will construct this later and uh, and define some of the or I'll talk about its properties. But um, what this does is uh, it captures the action of Galois on all torsion points of uh, of the elliptic curve over Q bar. Uh, and uh, what I will try to uh, discuss is how you can go back and forth from. Uh, knowing that the Galois representation, you can understand things about torsion, even things that are non-torsion, but uh, in particular about how um, Galois acts on torsion, and also knowing things about the torsion and other elements of the elliptic curve tells you things about uh, the Galois representation. And there's a lot of information that can be gathered uh, in one way or another. Uh, this picture, uh, maybe it reminds you actually of that famous poster that was in the math building for a long time, uh, so it's an, this talk is some uh, form of an updated um, version of my uh, defense of my of my thesis. In that uh, here, I'm still interested in how Galois acts on points, and in the picture, you see how Galois acts on a point uh, of order five um, when some action, and that action would tell you something about the um, the fivatic uh, Galois representation attached to this elliptic curve. So um, the beginning is uh, the Mordave theorem. So we know uh, that uh, the points, the rational points of, a, uh, of an elliptic curve over Q, that is a finitely generated abelian group. But of all the points that are over Q bar, that is not finitely generated. But the torsion subgroup is well understood. Uh, we know that the n torsion is a Z mod n uh, module of rank two. And we know that the action of Galois uh, in um, or that the Galois group acts on this uh, module because the uh, the Galois action commutes with addition that is uh, morphism defined over Q. Uh, so we study that Galois action, and when you have a Galois action on a module, uh, there are some basic questions you can ask. So, for example, uh, what are the fixed points of that action? What kind of fixed points can you have in in that action? And that is. Uh, the very uh, first uh, theorem in this area, which is already uh, a deep theorem of, of Mainzer that tells you the classification of torsion subgroups that can occur over Q. So, uh, and uh, of interest is that every, uh, every possibility can happen uh, for infinitely many uh, different J invariants. Next, uh, uh, about this Galois action, you can also ask what happens with uh, Galois invariant subgroups. So not now fixed point-wise, but um, a finite subgroup that is fixed uh, under Galois. And that has uh, even a longer history that um, with many names in the two for the complete classification of such uh, invariant subgroups, 
uh, with names like Freke Kenku, Klein, Kuber, Ligaza, uh, Mazur, and Og. Uh, Mazur, again, here contributing the main piece for the uh, isogenies of prime degree. Uh, and then uh, I think Kuber, or I mean, uh, Kenku, uh, completed a lot of the classification for uh, non prime degrees in particular. Uh, but in what the classification tells you is that if you have a finite, uh, a finite subgroup that is Galois invariant generated by P, then that, um, so if this is a cyclic uh, subgroup, then it is of one of these orders. And now uh, the classification uh, bifurcates in that you have the possibility that you have infinitely many J invariants or only finitely many J invariants. Because these classifications uh, correspond to some modular curves, in this case, X naught of N, and these are the values of N that give you a, a modular curve of genus zero versus values of n that gives you a genus, uh, genus uh, one or above uh, curve. But in all those cases, there is only finitely many points. Um, so for example, if you want to know, um, uh, if you want an isogeny or a, a rational subgroup of order 27, there is actually just one such J invariant. Uh, and that J invariant has complex multiplication and it will come up in a moment uh, a bit later. So um, wh what else we can do? Uh, I wanted to mention some of the work of my, um, of my current PhD student, Garen Chiloyan. So if you, um, oh, by the way, uh, so these rational subgroups that are fixed by Galois, those are in correspondence with isogenies uh, with cyclic kernel in that uh, if you have a, uh, if you have a uh, rational subgroup here, then you can have an isogeny that goes from E to, um, let's write it here, to E modulo uh, P. And if uh, that subgroup is the Galois invariant, then E mod P is actually an elliptic curve defined over Q and vice versa. If you have a rational isogeny of cyclic kernel, then the kernel is a Galois invariant subgroup. So um, you can talk also about isogenies over Q and then you can combine these two results that we just saw uh, and ask the following question. So if you have um, an isogeny, which we know what kind of isogenies we have over Q, you can ask what kind of possible combinations are there for the pair of torsion subgroups uh, at the beginning and at the end in the domain and the co-domain of, um, of this map. Uh, what combinations happen at the same time? There is going to be now a restriction that if you know um, what kind of isogenies you have, then there's going to be uh, limitations on what kind of torsion subgroups you can find on either end. Um, more generally, you can actually uh, try to classify what happens in the entire isogeny class. So if you have an elliptic curve, for example, here that has four elliptic curves in the isogeny class, you can ask, what kind of torsion subgroups can appear at the same time in one isogeny class over Q? And that's, uh, that's a question I asked uh, Garen uh, to work on for his thesis that I think uh, Garen actually talked here in the seminar. Uh, but just wanted to remind you that um, he actually uh, completed the classification of, the, of, of what, um, what are the possibilities. So for, for example, here is an elliptic curve that has, uh, there are four, elliptic curves in the isogeny class. They're connected by two isogenies. And um, here's what we call an isogeny torsion graph. Uh, so this is what we call an uh, example of an isogeny torsion graph where we uh, pick uh, an isogeny graph and we decorate it with uh, the torsion subgroups that happen uh, for one particular isogeny class over Q and also part of the information they such in a class are the degrees that happen in each um, uh, in each isogeny. And uh, what Garen uh, showed uh, is that there are there are 52 isomorphism types of isogeny torsion graphs attached to elliptic curves over Q or isogeny classes over Q. So for example, oh, so what kind of uh, isogeny graphs are there um, over Q? Uh, so this is uh, the isogeny graphs that happen over Q are uh, as follows. This was actually uh, essentially, this was known. Um, so for example, if you go back to the, uh, to the Antwerp uh, tables uh, in the Antwerp uh, paper, they say that these seem to be all the possible isogeny graphs that happen 
Uh, and then after essentially once the classification of isogenies of cyclic isogenies was completed, this was known, but there was no place where we could actually, we asked some people like Cremona, uh, what, uh, where can we find a proof of this? There was no place where we could find a proof. So we, we wrote in the, in the paper uh, uh, a, a proof of this, um, of this classification. In any case, there can be uh, linear graphs so uh, graphs with one, two, three, or four um, um, vertices. And I, you see that, uh, so there can be uh, P square isogenies, but for uh, P cube isogenies actually is only 27 that happens over Q. The J invariant that I gave you at the beginning is the J invariant that appears always uh, in one of the corners. Um, there can be TK graphs, what we call like two torsion graphs. So these are all connected by two torsion, by two isogenies. And there are some with four, six, or eight uh, vertices. There are rectangular graphs that involve two primes. And then there are what we call um, special graphs or S graphs, uh, because, well, there is an S uh, here or a five, I guess, but there is an S that you can draw in the graph. Um, but they're special in that they're sort of like the more complicated graphs. Uh, that one encounters in the classification. In, in any case, um, you probably saw already Garen's talk. And uh, so we have a full classification of what can happen in every case for an isogeny torsion graph, uh, which is as follows. So for example, this tells you that for T4 graphs, uh, you can have these uh, type of isomorphisms for, uh, for the abelian groups. This means uh, Z mod two uh, cross Z mod two and this would mean Z mod four. So the classification, for instance, tells you that you can have um, zero, one, or two Z mod fours at the vertices, but you can have uh, three types of Z mod fours. Or so you can have an, uh, an isogeny class that has Z mod four at every corner of the T4 graph. Okay, so that's part of the classification and the classification also we give examples of each kind, and now Garen in his the second part of his thesis, he's actually showing parametrizing all the possible elliptic curves with each kind, and showing which ones appear infinitely often, and which ones don't appear, uh, or only appear for finitely many uh, J invariants. Okay, so um, what are uh, what's in, in common between uh, Mazur's classification of the uh, torsion subgroups over Q? the classification of rational isogenies, uh, cyclic rational isogenies, the classification of isogeny torsion graphs. And the commonality is that all the information is captured by the adelic Galois representation of the elliptic curve. So um, given the, the action of Galois on the end torsion, uh, that induces a Galois representation of the Galois, the Galois group on um, the out on EN, so it gives you uh, a representation on, um, uh, into the automorphisms of the end torsion and picking a basis, um, which is a non canonical choice, but picking one basis, uh, you can uh, get uh, a map um, that goes into uh, GL2 of Z mod N. And we'll put it all together, uh, do an inverse limit. Uh, to get an adelic color representation uh, to put all the information together. But let me show you uh, what I mean that um, all the information is captured in the adelic representation. So for example, and there's an example of Mazur's theorem. <clears throat> if you have an elliptic curve where the torsion subgroup is Z mod eight cross Z mod two, what that tells you is that it's a basis of the eight torsion with a point P of order uh, eight that is defined over Q and a point Q uh, such that four times Q is defined over Q. With that information, uh, the Galois representation uh, that you get is a Galois representation into um, GL2 of Z mod eight that tells you that if you've picked your basis uh, correctly and it's in terms of P and Q, then uh, P is fixed and Q uh, has to be sent to something such that, well, four times Q is uh, defined over Q, so it has to respect that. Um, so it gives you uh, information about the image of the mod eight representation. And um, generically, 
uh, if you have an elliptic curve that has this torsion subgroup, generically the image will be exactly that modulo eight. And conversely, if you know that the image is this modulo eight, then it has this torsion subgroup, uh, or at least the two part of the uh, the two primary component would be that, which by the classification, then you know that's the entire torsion subgroup. Um, for isogenous over cues, it's, it's a very similar story. If you have an elliptic curve such that it has uh, a cyclic subgroup that is um, fixed by Galois of order 163, then you can pick uh, your basis so that P is the first vector. And now we don't have that P is fixed, but it's sent to a multiple of itself. And therefore the image is of a uh, Borel type uh, inside the GL2 of Z mod 163 and vice versa. If you have an image that it goes into Borel, then you have, um, you have an isogeny of uh, degree 163. Um, perhaps more surprisingly is that the classification of isogeny torsion graphs is also hidden or captured by the Galois, the idyllic representation of any one of the curves in the class. So for example, if you have a, an elliptic curve, uh, E, E is uh, here in the center, that it has a T4 uh, torsion graph and it has this property, uh, one of those where two of the corners are Z mod fours, then it turns out, this is something that uh, Garen computed, that the image is uh, contained in this subgroup of GL2 and Z mod four and vice versa. If you have an elliptic curve, one elliptic curve that the mod four representation goes into here, then you have a T4 graph with this property. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that it's very important to just, every time you know something about the elliptic curve, about isogenous, about torsion, um, that tells you something about the delicate representation and vice versa. You can extract information from the Galois representation itself. So Catherine, we- can I ask questions? Yeah, yeah, of course. In the, on the previous slide, let's say, if you know that you have a T4 isogeny graph like this, and you know, even know the set of subgroups, do you know how to arrange them? The set of two torsion, two power torsion subgroups? Like, do you know that it has to, that the two, two has to be in this, in the middle? Um, so yeah, so the, the, the two, two has to be in the middle because um, when you have Z mod two cross Z mod two, you have, um, uh, you have uh, three non-trivial uh, subgroups of order two that are fixed by Galois. And that gives you the three isogenies, the three non-trivial isogenies. So the two, two has to be in the middle. So every, in every two, uh, T4 graph, in the middle, there is going to be at least Z mod two cross Z mod two. Um, you could think like, well, is there more? Could there be in the middle a Z mod four cross Z mod two? But that would give you a four isogeny coming out from the middle, and then it wouldn't be a T four graph. Uh, it would have more. Um, there are there are more invariant subgroups, and it would give you something like a T six or perhaps a, a T eight graph. Yeah, so by knowing from the image, uh, the image tells you, for example, if you reduce mod two, everything reduces to the identity. And then you know that the full two torsion is defined over Q. And, um, but the full four torsion is not defined over Q. It cannot be, but there is not, um, uh, there is no four isogeny in this group. Um, so you can also look uh, in here and see whether there is anything that is uh, a four isogeny and there is none. So that tells you already that is going to be a T4 graph. And then you can even go now travel in the isogenies and knowing the, um, knowing the, the image here modulo uh, four, then it can tell you what happens in, in the other corners. Uh, Alvaro? Yeah. Uh, does, the, does this lift uniquely to Z mod eight or Z mod 16 or does it have many lifts? Uh, there's probably um, there's probably more than one left uh, in Zmod eight. Um, I would have to check whether there are. Um, so this this family is an infinite family. So this uh, the modular curve that cuts this out um, is a, a genus zero curve. There are infinitely many such elliptic curves. 
and I believe there will be subgroups that are above it that are, uh, so there are a couple of other, um, there are more than one subgroup above this one. So it's not, this does not determine uh, what is the two-attic galore representation or even the mod eight. Yeah, very good. So we're gonna put all of them together, um, all the representations together to try to understand everything about all the torsion subgroups at the same time, what can happen for all the torsion subgroups before we've seen what happens in the two torsion, what happens in the 163 to torsion. Um, but I would like to know what happens in the two times 163 and the four times 163. Can we combine these things to understand what are all the possibilities of uh, what are all the flavors of, of isogenies and torsion that can happen over Q? Uh, and for that, we're going to look at the action of the Galois on the entire Tate module. And this is the adelic Tate module. So I'm doing an inverse limit over all N uh, to get something that looks like two copies of Z hat. And then uh, the action of Galois induces uh, what we call the adelic L representation. And then what we would like to know is uh, up to conjugation, because I can just change my basis and get a different image. So up to conjugation, what are all the possible images uh, that can occur over Q attached to elliptic curves. That would tell me everything that can happen in terms of torsion, uh, subgroups, isogenies, and so on. And it would give me a, a lot of other types of information uh, along the way. Um, this, by the way, uh, was uh, is what's called uh, sometimes the Mazur's program B. So from the article, Rational Points on Modular Curves, um, uh, Mazur already asked this sort of question uh, can we give a, a classification of the of the images that happen in GL2 of Z hat? So let me tell you a little bit more. Um, where are we in the classification? What kind of things do we know? So first of all, uh, the um, Sayers open image theorem tells you that if you have an elliptic curve over a Q that does not have complex multiplication, then the image of the adelica representation is open, finite index in GL2 of Z hat. So the image is very large um, in, in GL2 of Z hat, it's a finite index. And moreover, in that paper, which is one of the richest papers in, that I've encountered, I keep going back to it over and over again. Uh, in that paper, Sarah shows that the image is never all of GL2 of Z hat over Q. Over a number of fields, it can happen that this is uh, uh, one. And in fact, it, I believe it, it happens for every other number of field that is an elliptic curve where their index can be one. But uh, over Q is always at least two. In fact, the index is even. And I'll go, I'll come back to this to explain uh, what Galois entanglements are to explain why that index is always um, at least two and in, and in fact, even. In that paper, also Sher asks, uh, what's known the uh, uniformity question. So if you don't have complex multiplication, uh, the uh, image modulo P is uh, a subgroup of GL2 of FP. And um, Sarah asks uh, whether you have uh, that it is actually surjective for a, um, a uniform constant for all elliptic curves. And is it in fact for P bigger than 37, do you always have surjectivity modulo P? And um, more recently, uh, Zewina, actually, I'm phrasing this as a conjecture, but if you assume Sayre's question, then this is a theorem. So if you assume a positive answer to Sayre's question, Zewina has shown that if you don't have more complex multiplication, then except for a finite number of exceptions for a finite number of J invariants, the index is one of the possible indices in this uh, set. These are not all the possible indices. There are J invariants that are in J that have even larger index, but um, we know that these appear infinitely often. Uh, these are the J invariants that appear infinitely often um, uh, for infinitely many different J invariants. Um, but this, is, this would be the classification on the indices. And then you could ask then what are the images that correspond to these indices? Um, by the way, so over and over again, we've, um, we've said uh, no CM, uh, no CM, no CM. So what happens in the CM case? The CM case is better understood. Uh, so let me just quickly say what happens in the adelic image 
in the CM case. So if you have an elliptic curve, so this is a, a theorem I, I proved, um, but please do see also so that um, uh, Abby Bourdon and Pete Clark have a series of papers on, on complex multiplication that uh, actually they proved some of these uh, things they proved before, uh, before I did, but I, I was, my paper is more like down to earth in terms of coordinates uh, that I just wanted to, to write basically a basis for the image uh, over um, Z hat. So if you have a uh, J invariant that is a complex multiplication uh, J invariant, and you take an elliptic curve that is defined over the minimal field of definition of that J of elliptic curves with that CM, um, then um, suppose, so that corresponds to some order in some quadratic imaginary field. And uh, I'm not going to go over this, but uh, using this recipe, you can construct uh, a mod N carton, and then you can construct a mod N quote unquote normalizer of carton and then do the inverse limit to get sort of like normalizer of Carton that is the adelic version of a Carton subgroup. Uh, I said quote unquote normalizer because for uh, when N is a prime, this uh, calligraphic N is a normalizer, but when N is not a prime, this is not the normalizer of the subgroup in general. So you have to be careful. But once you go all the way to the adelic uh, image, it becomes again, the normalizer of the, uh, of the Carton subgroup. In any case, the theorem is that we know what the image is. The image is contained in this normalizer of Carton and the index in the normalizer actually divides the number of units in the order that you are have CM by. Those orders, except for um, J0 and 1728, where you can have four or six units, every other order, the only units are plus or minus one. So this is saying that the image is always, or except for J0 and 1728, the image is just um, either the whole thing or index two. And uh, in, the, in, in the paper, I go sort of like classify exactly what are the possible images that can happen adelically. Uh, so there is more content in the paper to, to pin down what subgroup of order two of index two you can get in the adelic image. Okay, so, um, now, more also recently, um, this uh, amazing paper came out of uh, Jeremy Redden and, Zurich, and David Zurich Brown, where they completed something that I, I could not imagine that was completable, which is the classification of the two attic uh, Galois representations attached to elliptic curves over Q. So again, if there is no CM, from my work on CM, it actually follows that there is 32 images over Q up to conjugation adelically. So forget about the CM ones. Uh, without CM, what they say is that there is actually uh, uh, 1,208 possibilities up to conjugation. And um, moreover, the index of the image it divides 64 or 96, and the image is defined modulo 32. That means that uh, if you know what the image is modulo 32, then it's always the, um, the image to adequately is the full inverse image of whatever it is, modulo 32, which is very nice. Computationally, it's very nice because you don't have to go up to the 128th division field or something to understand a two-attic image. And, 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 and it keeps coming, it keeps getting better in that they have, there's a website now with a complete classification and you can navigate the tree of images. It's, it's really nice. But so we have this and they are working on completing a three attic uh, classification and five attic classification. They have other five attic, other P attic classification sort of in the works. So they already know a lot about other cases. Um, but now the problem is that knowing P attic pieces at a time doesn't tell you the whole story. And that is actually um, what happens in, the, in that, um, remark of Sayer that the image is always uh, of index two in the adelic representation, because even if you have surjectivity at every piatic representation, you can have entanglements that cut down the index uh, and the image is smaller. So here's what happens. So let's say um, 
when do you have the largest possible adelic image? So the largest possible adelic image would happen when the index is exactly two, and those do occur. Those are called Sir curves. And uh, Kujukaru, Grant, and Jones had already shown that almost all curves are Sir curves in the sense that if you have a one parameter family of elliptic curves, the uh, set of uh, counterexamples, the set of curves that are not Sir is thin in the sense of Hilbert irreducibility. Um, but those, that's the kind of theorem that actually, because you are using Hilbert, you don't have any actual examples of Sayre curves, even though you're saying that almost all of them are Sayre curves. Sayre himself, in that amazing paper, Sayre does give some examples of Sayre curves in his paper. Um, but it was actually my student, Harris Daniels, who, um, I had nothing to do with this one. This was already out of Yukon, so it was on his own. He found an explicit infinite family of Sayre curves. Um, so there are, and there are, um, there are a lot of Sayre curves. Okay, so what about, um, why is the image always of even index? So here's, the, here's what happens. You can either have, uh, there are two cases broken the, uh, depending on the discriminant of your, of your elliptic curve. If the discriminant is a square, then uh, the, the, uh, the two division field, which is generated by the roots of, if you have y squared equal, equals f of x, um, uh, if, if the discriminant is a square, then that Galois group cannot be an S3. So you can have that is either trivial or a Z mod three. In either case, the mod two representation is already indexed to in GL2 of F2. And therefore the two adic representation is already uh, of even index. And then the adelic one will be of even index. The other possibility, which is the more interesting one, is that the discriminant is not a square. Then what happens? Then it turns out the square root of the discriminant is always contained in the two torsion field and the two division field. But by Kronecker Weber, this is an abelian extension, so it has to be contained in some, um, in some cyclotomic field. But if it is contained in the nth cyclotomic field, then it is contained in the nth division field by the existence of the Weber pairing. And now you have, um, out of nowhere, you have a quadratic field that is in two places, and therefore the two division field and the n division field are entangled by this quadratic field. And that makes the image to not be sort of the products of the two Galois groups. It cuts down uh, the image and then the index is at least uh, two. So that is an Galois entanglement between the two and the nth division field. Let me give you an example of this. So for example, um, one of the very first elliptic curves in the tables. So here's a, uh, an elliptic curve that has uh, discriminant minus 43. That's not a square. So you have it in the two division field. And then it is also uh, by uh, class field theory, uh, it, it is inside uh, the 43rd division field. So those two are entangled. In this case though, we know from the classification of two attic uh, Galois representations, the two attic Galois representation is surjective. The 43rd color representation is surjective, and but the 86, the mod 86 color representation cannot be surjective because of this darned uh, quadratic field that prevents uh, those two um, for the Galois group of the 86 division field to be the product of the two Galois groups. May I ask a and, question? Yeah. Um, so what is it about Q, Q is missing some property that's allowing, you said in all other cases, you can find full image. I, I, Q, I believe there's some theorem, I forget who proved this, but I believe in every other, um, well, I, I think the, the key is that every abelian extension of Q is cyclotomic. Okay, right, that's the one special, okay. That, yeah, is, the, that is the special key. Right. Right. Yeah, that is the, the special thing about Q that otherwise you can have yeah, so you, you, I think the, the key is that you can find some other elliptic curve where this extension, this quadratic extension is not cyclotomic. 
and therefore is not contained in some other uh, division field by force. And then you don't have that, um, that uh, entanglement. Yeah, so, um, so this tells you that the image uh, modulo 86 is at least of index two, and that gives you that the index is at least two, and actually in, in his paper, Sarah shows that this image is of index exactly two. Now, that's when you have to pay a lot of attention because I'm going to change this elliptic curve, just that sign, that plus sign is going to change to a minus sign and the picture is going to be completely different. Okay, ready? So now the example is the same except that now there is a minus. <clears throat> so with that minus, now the discriminant is minus 11, same deal, uh, the square root of minus 11 is in both places in the two division field and the 11th division field. And um, same story, the two attic regular representation is surjective. The 11 attic is surjective, but the uh, mod 22 is not surjective again because of that field. But there is an additional problem now um, that the uh, torsion subgroup is non-trivial. There is a five torsion group. Um, so now the five attic representation is also in jeopardy. Uh, and what happens from what we saw is that the Galois uh, representation, the mod five representation has to go into a Borel with a one here. And that has index 24 in GL2 of F5. So now between this 24 and uh, this entanglement and the tw mod 22, now I have at least an index of 48. Okay. Um, but now if you let me use my best infomercial voice, but wait, there is more. Um, so it turns out, so this is what we knew before, but in addition, there is an, an isogeny of degree 25 in, for this elliptic curve. There's an isogeny to this other elliptic curve. And now what it tells me is that modulo 25, the image is not the full pre-image, the full uh, inverse image of what happened mod five, it is still small uh, mod 25. So it is Borel mod 25 still, and this has to be one mod five because there is a point of order five uh, defined over Q. So now this index is 120. So together with the problem at uh, 22, now this tells me that the image is at least 240 in index, okay? And this is not the largest index. Uh, in fact, so for example, you can, uh, this is something that uh, Zewina mentions in his paper that if the J invariant is minus seven times 11 cubed, then the index is at least 2,736. And I believe this is the largest index uh, we know for a non-CM elliptic curve. Alvaro, uh, yeah. does anyone know if these, anyone have an exact number if it's not two or do we just have estimates? Or we just have bounds? Oh, uh, you mean for this 240? Right, correct, yeah. Um, I, I, I haven't done it, but we, we could, that's something that you can settle, that you can work a little harder and just make sure that the mod 125 representation is the full inverse image of this and uh, check up, you have to check a few more things to make sure that the index is what it is. Um, but this is something we can do. Um, and so I haven't done it, but the, you, can, you can check that the index is exactly 240 in this case. I, and I believe it is, but I, I haven't done it. Okay, all right, so, um, so now some of the work we've been doing is try to understand um, what are these entanglements? What kind of entanglements can we see and classify uh, uh, to trying to understand how small can the image be or what kind of images we have? So one work, some work uh, that I've done, this is in the archive uh, with Harris Daniels is um, how bad can entanglements be? So the worst case scenario would be that two division fields actually coincide. Um, that seems quite unlikely, but it does happen. So for example, uh, for this elliptic curve, the second division field is equal to the third division field is equal to the sixth division field is equal to this splitting field. And uh, on this other elliptic curve, the two division field equals the four division field. That's even um, strange to wrap your, hand, your head around. And what happens is that if you start from Q and try to adjoin enough to get the two division field, 
you get the four division field for free. It's all defined over Q at join I. And um, this is by the way, so you see that here that Q and the third division field are connected. Um, we call that a horizontal entanglement versus uh, this, which is the, a power of the same prime is entangled with itself. Um, so we call that a vertical entanglement. So we've worked on both and we've tried to classify what kind of uh, these things can happen. So in the vertical, uh, in the vertical side, what we've proved is that if you have uh, a P to the N division field is equal to the P to the N plus one division field. And it turns out that this only happens for P equals two and N equals one, which is one of the examples I showed you before. And we can explicitly parameterize all the elliptic curves with this problem, okay? In proving that, we actually also looked at uh, a milder version of that. You can imagine that if this happens, then uh, the, the P to the N plus one roots of unity would be contained in the P to the nth division field, which is already strange. But uh, so if that happened, uh, if the P to the N plus one roots of unity are contained in the P to the nth division field, then uh, P is two. For a long time, we tried to prove that, okay, we reduced it to P equals to two. And then we tried to prove that it doesn't happen for P equals to two. And then we realized that it does happen. So uh, for this elliptic curve, it turns out that the two to the uh, n plus one through its infinity are always contained in the two to the n division field for all n bigger than one. So they get ahead of themselves, all these roots of unity, and they are in the, in the layer below all the time. In, in fact, we looking around, uh, we found one other strange case or of an elliptic curve that has the 16th roots of unity are contained in the fourth division field. Um, but that, that's, that's all, that, it doesn't, that phenomenon doesn't carry over to higher levels. But um, so things like this happen, but only for two, for the prime two can, uh, can these things happen. And, and these are very peculiar elliptic curves. So this is, some, uh, again, some complex uh, multiplication elliptic curve. And I figured that out that this could happen because we knew exactly what is the image of the Galois representation of the Dalek Galois representation for this elliptic curve. In the horizontal setting, um, we, um, we prove the following, that if you have that some P to the N division field equals a Q to the M division field, then it turns out that it's also the example that I showed you before where this is the two division field and this is the three division field. Uh, we are not able to do the full case of, an, of a coincidence, um, but we can do it if the coincidence is a billion. If it is a billion, then it is uh, the two division field equals the four division field or the three division field equals the six division field. Okay, all right. But this, that, by the way, this is non-abelian. Uh, this is an example of uh, non-abelian entanglements um, because the both Galois groups are, uh, are S3 in that case. All right. So, and now the, what we are uh, working on now um, um, with Harris Daniels and Jackson Morrow, uh, we're trying to understand even more broadly what kind of entanglements uh, we can have. And in particular, we're interested in uh, abelian entanglements. Uh, so um, we are trying to understand uh, what kind of abelian entanglements can occur. And um, this is how abelian entanglements would happen. So you have the A division field and some B division field. And in the intersection, uh, we want to know what kind of abelian extensions can happen in the intersection of two division fields. Um, in general, well, you would have inside the A division field, you have the A roots of unity, you have the B roots of unity. And if D is the GCD of A and B, then you will have the D roots of unity are for sure in there in the intersection. But you could have more of an intersection that is abelian over Q and if so, if you have extra stuff in there that is a billion over Q, and this extension is um, isomorphic to S, then we say that is an S, uh, an entanglement of type S. Um, 
Now, what could one way this could happen is that imagine that the A division field, for some reason, has stuff that is inside uh, the B um, the B cyclotomic units. Okay, then then if that happens, then there's going to be an intersection uh, of these um, of these number fields that is contained in the B um, in the B cyclotomic units. If so, whenever you find in an A division field, you find stuff that corresponds to some other cyclotomic field, then there is going to be an intersection just because of uh, Kronegger Weber. So we uh, just because of the existence of the Weber pairing. So we call these extensions when when this happens, we call that a Weber entanglement because we know where to find entanglement every time that there is more abelian extensions inside the A division field more than that. So, um, hey, Julian Alvaro, yeah, uh, just a quick question. Can yeah. the same thing happen on both sides of that picture or can it only happen on one side of the picture? Yeah, it can happen. So the, the, it can happen in, in both sides. It could happen that the A division field contains the stuff from the B roots of unity or uh, the opposite, that the, the B division field has the stuff from the A roots of unity. Yeah, you know, it's sort of symmetric. Yeah, it could happen that they both happen at the same time, uh, and then it's even more strange. And that also happens sometimes. But, um, but for for now, we're going to describe one of the sides, and then uh, we can put them all together. So here's three types of abelian entanglements uh, that we've seen. There is the Sayre entanglement, uh, which is when the discriminant uh, is not a perfect square, then this discriminant is in the two division field and it is in the nth division field for some n because of uh, Kronecker Weber. Um, there is also what we call CM entanglements. When you have a, an elliptic curve that is CM, there is a quadratic field, which is the, the quadratic imaginary field of CM. It turns out for n bigger than three, k is always containing the n division field. So that quadratic field will be in every uh, division field and that is an entanglement. But that, by the way, when I spoke about the image, that Delic image, the Delic image was the normalizer of a carton. That difference between, so if you go from Q or Q adjoint J to K adjoint J, then you have a carton. So when I spoke about the image, the image already takes into account this, um, this K. So when we said that the image inside the normalizer of in the, is of index two, one or two, if it's of index two, it's not because of this entanglement. There is something else happening. Uh, so this one is already accounted for in that sort of normalizer of Cartan. And then there is also vein entanglements, which is what I just saw, uh, we just spoke about when the A division field uh, contains stuff from the B roots of unity, then they have to be entangled because of the they pairing. So that we call those they entanglements. So let me give you some examples of things that are not of this form. So, uh, oh, well, let me give you first a family of they entanglements. Uh, so here is an elliptic curve. So without the D, uh, this is a family of elliptic curves, a one parameter family, and then twist it um, do a quadratic twist by D. It turns out that uh, this family was chosen because it has two independent three isogenies. And as I twist, uh, I, can, I can compute what is, uh, so the image is a split carton, and I can compute the field of definition of both characters. And uh, the field of definition is precisely Q at the square root of minus three and the square root of D. So if you give me any other division field, I can look at the roots of unity. I can figure out what quadratic field is inside those roots of unity. And then I can twist this family to get that entanglement between three and any n you give me, I can find what quadratic field to entangle with. So there is going to be always a three n entanglement um, between uh, the three division field and the n division field uh, with the appropriate twist. And then because this is a one parameter family, there's infinitely many such elliptic curves that have this type of entanglement. So we've actually been working on 
constructing these type of entanglements, what kinds uh, one can have. And I'll show you more about like which ones we have identified uh, in a moment. Now, more generally, what kind of abelian entanglements can happen between mod P and mod Q? So mod P, you have um, the image uh, in GL2 and then the image in GL2 of FQ. And what we're interested in is what kind of an intersection of these two that is abelian over Q. So uh, Harris and I had already proved um, that if you have one B division field, what can be abelian over Q, it turns out it's either just the cyclotomic units if the image is surjective or one of the exceptional images, um, you can have um, the cyclotomic units times a quadratic number field if the image is one of the normalizer of Cartan images, or you can have a cyclotomic times a quart oh, uh, uh, up to an extension of degree P minus one if the image is Borel. So we know what kind of uh, abelian extensions are there inside the p uh, the mod p extension the the p division field. So now the question is, can you make those extra? So if if the entanglement is between the p um, cyclotomic and the and something else, then that's going to be one of these Vey entanglements. So we understand those. So what I'm wondering is. These extra fields that appear here, those extra other number fields, can those be entangled with some other uh, Q division field? So for example, you can have, uh, in this example, what happens is that the, suppose that the two uh, uh, division field is actually a cyclic cubic inside um, in, in GL2. So, it is not an S3, but the, the discriminant is actually a square and then you get a cyclic cubic. So in this case, you get that it's a cyclic cubic the discriminant is 31 square for that cyclic cubic. And you can have in it, this example, the seven, um, the mod seven image is a Borel because there is a seven isogeny. And it turns out that the character that cuts out the kernel of that isogeny is a cyclic sextic of discriminant minus 31 to the fifth. So it turns out that the cubic inside the sextic coincides with the cubic from the two division field. So this that is strange coincidence. And then that makes an entanglement um, between the two and the seventh division field. This is not an elliptic curve with CM, so it's not a CM entanglement. The entanglement is not quadratic. Um, it's not the quadratic entanglement that comes from SER. So it is not a SER entanglement. An entanglement field is not contained. This entanglement field is of discriminant 31 squared. Uh, it is not contained in the two roots of unity and it's not contained in the seventh root of unity. So it's not one of these vein entanglements. And this example is actually one of an infinite family of such examples. You can think of all the possibilities of images, mod P, mod Q, and see if you can make those entanglements happen. And uh, you can have, for example, uh, if you have two images that are Borel, mod three and mod five, that can happen, but that would give you that you have a 15 isogeny, but there's only finitely many J invariants with a 15 isogeny. So this is one of them where you can, once you have the, um, the three and the five isogeny, um, you can twist it appropriately so you actually know exactly what is the intersection between the three and the fifth division field and is going to be some, um, some quadratic field. And, um, and then you have an entanglement between the three and the fifth division field, so that can happen. But again, this can only happen for finitely many J invariants because this construction where both images are Borel can only work in so many, only for three and five, in fact. Um, here's an example uh, that, so here the, the mod three image is in the normalizer of a non-split Cartan, uh, but it's not a CM elliptic curve. Uh, mod five is Borel. When you have a normalizer of non-split Cartan, it works sort of like in the CM case that the group uh, or the extension fixed by the normalizer of Cartan is quadratic. 
Um, and then you have a quadratic field, in this case, Q at the end of square root of 37. And it just happens that in the Borel, the character that cuts out the isogeny, it all is, in this case, a quartic extension, but the intermediate quadratic field is a square root of 37. So this could happen. Um, and this is a non-CM, non ser non, non ve entanglement. So it's some new type of entanglement. But it turns out that, interestingly, um, ellipticers that have normalizer of non-split cartan at three and Borel at five is an infinite family. But for this entanglement to happen, um, you would, you, so we can actually compute the image that would happen that this actual entanglement happened and this is a higher genus curve when the entanglement happens. Um, so there's only finitely many of these examples and this is one of them. It might be the only one uh, out there. Um, you can actually, I didn't say, but you can, we can find the same kind of entanglement also with a split Cartan and Borel image, but again, it's only one of finitely many such images. Okay, so what we've proved in an upcoming paper is the following, is in fact that, um, so I'm not going to read the, the theorem, but what it says is that mod PQ, if there's an entanglement of type PQ, so it's an entanglement between the P division field and the Q division field, uh, then except for finitely many J invariants, the entanglement is one of those that I showed you, which is between two and seven, when the entanglement is a cubic, uh, a cyclic cubic extension. And that's it. There is a, there's some, and in fact, three one parameter families of J invariants with this property. Um, but the entanglement, except for other finitely many examples, which I've given you a few of those examples, it has to be a cubic cyclic extension and the entanglement is between the two and the seven field. Um, we've also worked, uh, theorem B here tells you that uh, we can construct infinitely many uh, J invariants with a three N entanglement, a seven, a five N, seven N, and M N with M in one of those cases. So those all happen infinitely often. Uh, another, if you're interested in complex multiplication, another thing we can show is that in fact, just like in the SER uh, curve case or in the non-CM case, the, the SER image is always of index two adelically. It turns out that in the CM case, except some J invariants we cannot work for, and we cannot do it for, but in all, most of the, uh, cases of ellipticers over Q with CM, the image is actually of index two always in the adelic image, which already takes into account this, uh, this CM entanglement with the quadratic imaginary field. There is one additional entanglement, which is of A type, in fact, um, but there is always a little bit more of an entanglement um, over Q. And finally, we've also extended this business of entanglements a little bit into um, the realm of abelian varieties, uh, where we can also find uh, some types of entanglements uh, constructed in similar ways, like we've done in the other cases. So anyway, this is it. Um, I hope you can see sort of like where we are and the kind of things we can do. There's a lot more work in terms of entanglements. Um, uh, so, um, People like Nathan Jones and his collaborators have done also a lot of like work on entanglements and non-abelian entanglements and so on. So there's a bunch of us that are interested in this, um, but uh, we're slowly uh, picking at the problem of classifying all these adelic representations. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for our speaker? Uh, Alvaro? Yeah. There was, you, you gave an example earlier of, a, of some really huge index, and, but I don't think you ever mentioned what type it was. What explained that really huge index? Um, I believe that is an elliptic curve that has, um, it has a 37 isogeny. And um, that alone, when you cut, GL2 Zmod 37 um, into into a Borel, the index is is pretty large. So it's uh, it is explained from 37 isogenies. 
but again, there's only two. Uh, there's only I think only two gene variants, uh, two or three gene variants with uh, 37 isogeny. So that's one of these like finitely many cases uh, that go into that uh, set of exceptions from the uh, the theorem of Zewina. Alvaro, can I can I ask? Um, is it is it known that let's say I take a P and a Q and I want to ask if there's an entanglement between P and Q of, of any sort? But once they're big enough, is it known that there's not an entanglement? If P and Q are big enough? Yeah. Um, so if you assume um, So if you assume against Sayer's uniformity, then I think the answer is yes. If you if you had um, elliptic curves with um, for arbitrarily large primes, you had elliptic curves with a no normalizer of non-split Cartan image, you would always have this issue that for that large prime there would be this quadratic field that could potentially be inside the, so for P you have normalizer of non-split Cartan. There is this field K in there, this quadratic field K, and that quadratic field K could entangle with some other Q uh, along uh, another large prime. There is no rhyme or reason to what that P, that quadratic field could be. Well, in fact, there is some rhyme or reason to it, but it could be, Q adjoined the square root of Q for some other large Q. And then the P and the Q would be entangled. Beyond that, I don't think there are any other entanglements that could happen. So uh, so no, there, there, there wouldn't be and, any and, other. And those shouldn't happen. That's just that, a hesitant proof. Yeah, those, those should, we, we think there is no beyond uh, uh, beyond 13, there, there are no other elliptic curves with non-split Cartan image. So those shouldn't happen in principle. Yeah. So in, in principle, it's a finite check of if you give me an elliptic curve and you want to know all the PQ entanglements, then it is a finite check just to see what is happening, what kind of of um, non-surjective images you have mod p at every p and then just and then you can sort of start to compute like where would there be an entanglement if there is one i see i see yeah i have a question yeah what actually happened to that poster of yours on the bu wall <laughs> I think it like, fell apart at some point and it was right. finally, it had a graceful death. Oh, you didn't retrieve it. Hey, didn't we offer you to come and get the pieces because they were falling off? Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I think I do have like PDFs of the of the pieces. So I, I think I, I let you just uh, recycle it into the earth. <laughs> okay. Are you hopeful that you could make a, I don't even know how to quite formulate this, but like some kind of complete classification of, but then let's, that's a broad beginning of a sentence, but then make the end smaller. PQ entanglements of some restricted type where you fill in the right words to put in there. Um, I mean, maybe that's what some of the theorems do in that last slide that I kind of haven't internalized yet. It, it, they sort of, they tell you, um, it, it is sort of what that said, at least mod PQ, it tells you that it for, except for finitely many types, all the entanglements are actually just two seven entanglements. Right, right. So but let's say all those, those finitely many types, is there a way of like, now it's finite. Now you can just write them all down. like. How big is that set? Like, do you have, like, like I, we we do have 
sort of like the candidates and some of them happen, some of them don't. Um, but there is a, a finite list of, of candidates of what, which ones do happen. And in the yeah, paper, what, sort of like, what is it? What do you mean by candidates? Uh, so the, the candidates kind of are, you can, you can classify by like the, the maximal image. So we, we have, again, conjecturally, we have a, an, a classification of what images can happen um, uh, modulo P. Right. Um, if you assume that there is no normalizer of non-split carton after 13, right. then we have a full list. I believe it's 63 images mod p that can happen. So you can tell me: Is there an entanglement between an image of this type and an image of that type? And then you can try to figure out if there could be a group theoretic entanglement of that sort. Then you construct the modular curve, and then we can actually try to find all the points on that modular curve. Oh well, have you have you so have you done it? Like you, you're not just so. Have... So I'm lucky to have like collaborators that know how to do these things, and yeah. they have been working on it. So for example, um, um, Harris, Daniels, and Enrique Gonzalez Jimenez, they wrote down equations for every single entanglement that can happen that cuts out a modular curve of genus zero and one. So there is a classification, and in fact, they they find all the points when the genus is one. Um, they, they find all the points, you know, whether the rank is positive or not. If it's positive, they actually parameterize the elliptic curve, the modular curve, and they give you like what the J invariant would be. And when it's, uh, uh, the rank is zero, they also find if there are torsion points that correspond to J's, there is the list of J's. They even have some examples of genus two curves that are cut out with that they were able to, for genus two, they were able to compute the J's that happen. So we have a lot of information about which ones can happen. And in the paper that we're writing, we actually go through the trouble of saying like, okay, these could happen. It's only going to be finitely many cases, but this could happen and here's an example. This could happen and here's an example. So we basically have a full like list of like what mod PQ examples can happen. So when you said there's a rank one case, like the modular curve is rank one. Yeah. Then, um. But then they have an infinite, an infinite collection. Yeah, so, so that's only so, for the two seven. So they give you they give you the the equation of the modular curve. For example, one is two hundred and twenty five a one, like the elliptic with that Cremona that uh, that Cremona uh, label, and then they give you what the J invariant is in terms of the x and the y coordinates of that elliptic curve. So they give right, you right. what the J invariant is for any point on that elliptic curve, which is rank one. They give you what the J invariant would be of the elliptic curve that has that entanglement that is parameterized by these elliptic curve of genus one. But right, I'm just trying to understand because your theorem is like, there's only finitely many except for this two seven type entanglement. Yeah. So is that the two, that, that describes the two, the two seven type entanglement, that, that infinite family? Yeah, so there is a, an, infant, an infant family that describes the two seven uh, entanglement that we do know that it happens infinitely often and they give you exactly what is the J invariant. Those are genus zero. So those are easier to classify and they give you exactly what the J invariant is. I haven't written it here because it's, it, it's a pain to, to write it all down, but you can explicitly write and then you can just plug in and then it gives you Oh, I, I actually, I think they're genus one, genus one. So they are more difficult to come up with the, with examples, but they, you can just plug in a point on that elliptic curve and then it gives you a J invariant of an elliptic curve with that property. Yeah. Okay, but so for, for, the, for, the, the, for the, so for in the theorem A though, when you have this finite set of J invariants. Yeah. You could, it seems like you could, conjecture at least, figure out the full list of those J invariants. And maybe your collaborators have kind of done that. Yeah, so we, we can, we, um, I, I, yeah, at, at least like, I think I can, I can throw in enough J invariants that if there are examples, they are in this, in this list. Okay, okay, like there, okay. There okay. were some examples that I, I couldn't even compute if there was an entanglement. Like we know there is, um, that the image happened. So what this parameterizes is both images. It is a Zimod three, the two images Zimod three, the seven images Borel. 
Okay. That only tells you. And then within that, there could be an entanglement of the, of the, um, of the two fields. And then that entanglement could actually be non-abelian in some cases. So some cases it is, some cases it isn't, but you have to sort of like compute and like those computations and in some, in some of the cases is just, um, they're very difficult to, to do. I, I, I wasn't able to compute, to finish at one computation that there was an entanglement, possible entanglement between, a, um, it was like normalizer of non-split carton at three and uh, normalizer of uh, split carton at five. And then I had to try to compute if there was an entanglement and my computer just took forever and I couldn't do it. So I can give you a list of J invariants that potentially um, every exception would be there. Uh, I think how, I, how, how, how long is that list? I'm sorry, I'm still asking, how long is that list? <laughs> it, would be a, it would be a very short list, in fact. Oh, a short uh, list, not like 10,000 things. It's just like a 10. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, no, it's, oh, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a very long list because there are oh, that's great. Some, many of the entanglements we can just, just uh, we can just prove that they don't happen. These pairs don't happen. And then there is only very few combinations um, where this can happen. Um, well, I mean, it, it, I think it is going to be a very short list, but there is, uh, there's probably some genus two or genus three curves that we haven't computed all the points. There, very likely there are no points on those curves. So it's going to be a very short list, um, but it is going to be like, you know, in like the twenties or thirty numbers in that list, not like thousands. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Are there other questions for Alvaro? If not, let's thank Alvaro again for a really lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right.